Swordfish are so famous that we can sometimes take it for granted there are actually half-ton fish wielding swords on their noses swimming the oceans, slicing through the water at high speeds. However, their memorable appearance is only part of what makes these creatures so fascinating. They actually spend a large part of their lives in the cold of the deep sea, so even if their prey lurks lower than the sun can shine, they are still not safe from being struck by the enormous bill of a swordfish. Swordfish have developed many methods to reach such harsh environments where they are operating at the extreme of what is possible for their bodies. Swordfish are from a group known as billfish that contain all the other large spear-nosed fish like marlins, sailfish and all their relatives. However, they are not actually very closely related to this group and as a result are quite different. Swordfish have been assigned to their own family which they are the sole living members of. Unlike the other billfish, swordfish have no teeth as adults and no pelvic fins. However, one of their most distinguishing features is that their bill is flatter and more sword-like, whereas the other billfish have more rounded bills. They can also resist more extreme environments, and we can see this in their behaviour. All billfish are highly migratory, swimming over great distances, but the migrations of sailfish and marlins generally don't stray too far from tropical waters. However, swordfish travel into much colder temperate seas, and although definitely not common, can even be found in the Arctic. But what really sets them apart is their vertical migration. Swordfish have a daily routine of diving into the depths during the day, and then returning to shallower water at night. They regularly dive to depths of around 200 to 800 metres, which is a region of the ocean known as the mesopelagic or twilight zone. Sunlight is still present at these depths, but incredibly faint, so they are detecting the faintest glimmer of light reflecting off their tiny prey. During the Second World War, advancements in sonar technology started to reveal a layer in the ocean that scattered the sound and so was mistaken for the seabed. This false seabed was also seen to rise and fall throughout the day, rising at night and then sinking into the deep during daylight hours. This false seabed was later discovered to actually be millions of small creatures like fish, squid and jellyfish migrating from the deep into shallower waters. The majority of the migrators are fish like lanternfish that scatter sonar because of the empty space in their swim bladder contrasting against the ocean. These migrating marine animals are known as the deep scattering layer, which is one of the biggest animal migrations on earth and they live like this by feeding at the surface and then sinking into the depths to avoid large predators that come out during the day. However, some large predators have adapted to follow these sea creatures and feed on them, like swordfish. Swordfish are heavily influenced by the deep scattering layer in their own migrations. They have a similar pattern as they follow it up and down the water column foraging. Other billfish like sailfish also perform deep dives for prey, but don't dive as deep as swordfish, and tuna are also known to feed from the deep scattering layer, but not as regularly. Swordfish are extremely well adapted to live this way. As they are making the journey into the deep, their large and powerful tail muscles create a lot of heat. These main swimming muscles are held close to the centre of the body to prevent heat loss, and the muscles are also supplied with a complicated network of blood vessels to prevent the warm blood from leaving the swimming muscle region of the body. These adaptations keep the temperature of their muscles above the sea around them and keep them functioning at full strength as the temperature plunges in the deep sea. They also have ways to keep their eyes functioning at full capacity as the temperature drops as well. Just like humans and other vertebrates, swordfish have multiple muscles to control the movement of their eye, known as the extracular muscles. However, in swordfish, one of these muscles has been modified to prioritise creating metabolic heat over muscle contractions. So unlike their swimming muscles that make a lot of heat as a byproduct from swimming, in a way this eye muscle has evolved to become a heater. The retina performs optimally at certain temperatures, especially its ability to respond to rapid visual changes. So by using this heating organ to maintain this temperature, it helps them detect the light bouncing off fast moving prey like fish and squid. Swordfish have evolved to transfer heat produced by this organ to the brain as well, keeping it warm and allowing for clear thinking in colder waters. However, their bodies are well adapted to keep this heat flowing through a few select organs while stopping the warm blood from dissipating through the rest of the body. Swordfish have a complicated network of blood vessels that run counter to each other, so heat can be transferred more efficiently, which is known as a countercurrent exchange. So just like with their main swimming muscles, this keeps blood that runs through the heating organ eyes and brain hot, but prevents it from being lost in the blood that runs through the rest of the body. Most importantly, this keeps the heat from being lost through their gills. As fish gills are extremely efficient at transferring oxygen from the sea into their blood, they are accidentally also very efficient at transferring heat from their blood into the sea as well. 
which is not ideal while trying to survive in the cold. So, swordfish are largely cold-blooded animals that keep parts of their body warm. This is actually something that is shared by many other large predatory fish and named regional endothermy. Tuna and many species of shark, like great whites and basking sharks, also are considered regional endotherms. Although the way in which they create body heat in the first place and the way it is transferred through the body can be different among the different animals. These fish are not closely related. Even swordfish and tuna are actually quite distantly related. Tuna are most closely related to mackerel, and rather surprisingly, genetic study has suggested that swordfish and other billfish are actually more closely related to flatfish like halibut or plaice. This means that all these creatures have independently evolved partial warm-bloodedness. Some of these predatory fish, like tuna and maybe some species of shark, actually have a higher capacity for keeping their muscles warm, but swordfish dive deeper and for longer than all these other predatory fish. This may be because swordfish excel at regulating their body temperature. The body and water temperature from free-swimming diving swordfish was studied, and the data seems to show that swordfish are in control of how quickly their body heats up and cools down. So they slow down the rate at which their body cools during a dive and accelerate the rewarming as they are returning to the surface. The researchers argue that swordfish achieve this by rerouting blood to spread the heat more freely from the warm regions of their body while in warmer water, but tightly conserving the heat within the specific regions while swimming in colder water. Due to their thermoregulation and other features, swordfish are the deepest divers out of all the large surface fish. They repeatedly dive from the surface to the twilight zone, but have been recorded diving even deeper. Study of swordfish diving depths found that although not a regular occurrence, most of the swordfish in the study dove below 900 meters at certain points. However, one swordfish was recorded in waters as deep as 1664 meters. This is interesting because sunlight does not penetrate these depths, creating a completely dark environment where the only light comes from bioluminescent organisms, and swordfish still swim at these depths, presumably to hunt. A swordfish's most famous feature is undoubtedly their sword or bill, and they possess this from their larval stage when they are feeding off small zooplankton. As they become a fully grown adult, the sword can measure up to 1.5 meters long, and make up to a third of their overall body length. A swordfish's bill is not used for stabbing or jousting, but instead slashing. Swordfish usually hunt by swimming through a school of fish or other prey, and then quickly whipping their bill to strike at their victims, stunning them and then quickly snatching them in their jaws while they are disorientated. Swordfish bills are horizontally flat, but they are also serrated and so can be used to cut up their prey too, causing more injury. Swordfish have also been observed using their sharp bills to cut their prey into smaller pieces before consumption, or as a defensive weapon against threats. A swordfish's sword is an extension of their upper jaw and forehead that has been elongated, and in most cases is fairly typical bone, similar to the rest of the swordfish's body. Bone usually consists of collagen that has been embedded with certain minerals, mainly calcium phosphate, giving the bone its rigidity. A swordfish's bill has a high concentration of minerals at the tip, but is more porous at the base, where it makes contact with the swordfish's skull. This means the tip is strong and rigid to withstand the high forces of hitting prey, but is slightly flexible at the bottom to allow some give, preventing it from snapping. Damaged swordfish bills have actually been used in experiments to uncover some very unique aspects of fish skeletons. Bones are primarily made up of non-living components like collagen and minerals. However, there are four main types of bone cells that are important in regulating growth and repairing damaged bones. The most common are called osteocytes, that guide the growth of the bone, monitor bone integrity, and if the bone sustains damage, they can stimulate other cells to repair the bone. The cells that repair the bone are the osteoclasts, that break down and dissolve damaged sections of the bone, and the osteoblasts, that form new bone in their place to remodel it. What is unique about bony fish is that most of them do not have osteocytes, including swordfish and other billfish. They have what are called acellular bones, they do have the cells for breaking down and building bone, but don't have the cells that regulate their growth or guide the repair process. Since the osteocytes make up the overwhelming majority of bone cells, most fish bones under a microscope look distinctively empty of cells, so they are named acellular. For a long time it was thought that the osteocytes were absolutely crucial for bone growth and remodeling, and that this was the only way that broken bone could be healed. But as many fish live long and active lives, they must have alternative mechanisms for regulating their bone repair. Swordfish and other billfish offer a unique opportunity to study acellular fish skeletons, because as their bills are used as a percussive weapon, they are very commonly found fractured and injured. 
Study of their bills shows that despite not having osteocytes, these fish are very much capable of repairing their bills and the rest of their skeleton. And in fact, despite some differences, fractures and cracks are repaired in a similar way to mammals and other vertebrates. Interestingly, these bones don't seem to be primitive. Fish that are survivors from much more ancient lineages like eels or tarpons still produce osteocytes in their bones. So swordfish, along with the vast majority of fish living today, have evolved to lose or adapt these cells, and in fact they may have evolved to lose these cells multiple times independently. The sheer amount of fish that lack these cells in their skeletons show that it must offer them some sort of advantage. The swordfish's bill originates from their upper jaw. Fossil evidence show it wasn't always like this. The billfishes first appeared around 55 to 60 million years ago, and their earliest relatives or ancestors were significantly smaller, generally slender, and probably not apex predators yet. However, one of the most notable differences with early billfish is that both their upper and lower jaws were elongated. A lot of early billfish, like Hemingwaya, that is known from Turkmenistan, had an extended lower and upper jaw, and it is not exactly known what this double bill was used for. Hemingwaya were only around 40 centimeters long, lived in shallower water, and due to their fin placement, it is unlikely they were anywhere near as fast or powerful swimmers as modern billfish. They had a superficial resemblance to modern day needlefish, and may have lived and hunted in a similar way. However, the double elongated jaw wasn't confined to small species of billfish. An ancient relative of swordfish, named Ziphiorhynchus, that lived around 30 million years ago, also had both jaws elongated, but was much larger than even modern day swordfish. Ziphiorhynchus was around the size of a great white shark, and would have swam the open seas, meaning it is very likely to have hunted in a different way to the smaller prehistoric billfish. Both the billfish family, the Ziphidae, containing swordfish, and the Istiophoridae, containing the rest of the billfish, evolved from an ancestor that had a double bill. However, similarities in their skull and skeleton show that Ziphiorhynchus was likely related to swordfish, whereas there were other prehistoric double-billed fish that were more closely related to the Istiophoridae. So, the two families must have evolved the one bill on their own. Swordfish use their sword as a tool to get food, but it has also adapted to reduce drag in the water to help them achieve their incredible swimming speeds. Its shape is very hydrodynamic, but more explicitly than this, the base of their sword has a gland that secretes lubricating oil to help them cut through the ocean. This was first identified as a possible weak spot for their bill, and what it did wasn't really understood. However, further examination revealed there was a network of capillaries delivering oil from the gland to small holes on the fish's nose and head. It is likely this oil may create a lubricating layer, helping to reduce friction in the water, which could be one of the reasons swordfish can swim so quickly. Swordfish, like their billfish relatives, are among the fastest fish in the ocean. But their top speed is actually not well understood. The most common figure is around 100 km an hour or 60 miles per hour. But a lot of these top speed claims are often based on observations, and the reliability of the sources are questionable. The truth is that maximum speed is actually very difficult to study for any animal, but especially marine animals. It is difficult to gain a perfect top speed because animals very rarely travel in a straight line, and most animals will cruise at a much slower rate most of the time, only travelling at top speed for a few seconds. Also, a lot of the fastest fish in the ocean, like swordfish and sailfish, fare very poorly in captivity, making it difficult to study their speed in a controlled environment. One method used to try and work out how fast the fastest fish in the ocean can swim was by measuring the maximum speed their tail muscles could contract. It was found that the muscles of a sailfish wouldn't allow them to travel any faster than around 55 km an hour or 33 miles per hour. And actually, most of the time they swim a lot slower than this, making the highest speed estimates unlikely to be true. One major constraint that fast predatory fish face is a type of turbulence in the water known as cavitation that is damaging enough to erode metal. Some other research shows that fish may experience cavitation on their fins if fish were to swim much faster than this, so swordfish and sailfish are still some of the fastest fish in the ocean, it is just that all fish are probably slower than their older estimates. So swordfish may be striking due to their large sword and the way they wield it, but their lifestyle is arguably even more fascinating, as they constantly operate at the extreme of what is possible for their bodies. Thank you for watching. A big thank you goes to all my patrons, especially the big contributors that are listed here. If you like content like this, then consider becoming a patron as well.